Good, good morning. morning. How are we doing today? Good morning or evening or afternoon at home crew. We're excited you're with us as well. You're already standing, so uh, why don't we get into the worship? worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. No hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name. Lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. You've been faithful, you've been faithful through every storm, and you'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again, for your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things, and God, you do great things. No hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things, and we dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. One more time, hallelujah. Hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God. Unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. No hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. You have done great things. Oh God, you do great things.
There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul And I can say it is well Jesus is overcome in the grave shall be my eyes and Jesus is overcome and the grave is overwhelmed victory is won he is risen from the dead and I
And worthy of every song we could ever sing And worthy of all the praise we could ever bring And worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. And worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And oh, There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Sing Jesus the name. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me
What are your thoughts when you hear this word? Dinners, birthday parties, graduations, and weddings? Do you think of love, intimacy, and laughter? Or do you think of pain, absence, and conflict? Whatever your thoughts are, family was God's idea. His desire is for you to join his vibrant and growing family. A family marked by sacrifice and acceptance, marked by diversity, and unity, marked by an eternal significance. A family like that would be no ordinary family. Good morning. morning. How's everybody doing today? Enjoying this nice hot weather. As a pastor, I always pray for long, hot summer. You know why? because it gets everybody to slow down. And there's nothing as good for you as slowing down. Our bodies need to breathe and, you know, our souls need to breathe. And sometimes a good heat wave is a good way to slow down our souls a little bit and, uh, and help us take stock. And uh, I find if I have a good hot summer, I have a really great fall, you know. It just seems to be something refreshing about it. I don't know if you ever heard this story. There's an old movie called uh, The Ghost in the Darkness. It's one of my favorite movies um, of that kind of, you know, that kind of style of movie. And uh, it has Val Kilmer in it, and he does a pretty good role. But the genius of it is, is the role Michael Douglas plays. And basically, this is the story. It's actually a true story. Uh, the Tosovo Lions, uh, in around the late 1800s, the British uh, Empire was building a railway across Africa. And uh, there was this one uh, fairly significant um, waterway that needed to be bridged um, for this railway to succeed. And so they worked quite hard on it. And there were a lot of workers, especially a lot from India. Um, and it was proceeding fairly well until um, these two lions started to pick off workers. And the ranges, like the ranges of people that these lions killed um, range between 30 and 130. And basically they just, there was nothing they could do with these. They tried putting thorn bushes up. They tried hunting them. They tried all kinds of things. And these lions just started picking people off. And, uh, and the movie dramatizes it a little bit, but it's uh, not a whole lot. It, it, it really was a crazy time. The engineer on site, the head engineer, was a man named Patterson. He's played by Val Kilmer. And Patterson has to somehow deal with these lions. And, and the story of how he ended up killing them is almost as dramatic as, like, you couldn't all, all, all you couldn't really make it much more dramatic a movie like quite, quite literally the second line by the time he kills it it's been shot six times and the last shot he fires into it it is nine on a branch beside his foot and just the tear of these and and we we sometimes think of nature is this kind of beautiful you know um majestic um, thing in our world because we're quite insulated from it but um, in reality nature is not only beautiful it's very dangerous uh, human beings as we learn often to our detriment or we forget to our detriment um, a lot of nature is trying to kill us and and regularly trying to kill us it's not easy surviving in this world it is a struggle and uh, we with our wonderful health care and our insular world and all those kind of things like that uh, don't know what it's like to live in abject terror of some sort of beast that could come and snatch you away at any time uh, but this is in history has been the way most of the people in the world have lived they've had this reality of okay don't go in the woods at night because you might not come out again and at 
naturalists kind of look at the, the world and they break down animal groups into hierarchies. And always at the top of a hierarchy is what they call an apex predator. Um, there's a lot of controversy or a lot of debate over how many actual apex predators there are in nature. Some people say 10, some people say as many as 20. Um, but they are the biggest, meanest, most dominant force. An apex predator basically define it means there's nothing that can hunt the apex predator. It nothing, has nothing to fear from in its environment. It can quite honestly go about and do what it needs to do. It doesn't live in any danger. And so apex predators are, are ones that we're often fascinated with because they, they are, um, s tend to be just terif terrifically powerful. And, uh, and this can make an impact on us. So this is what I want to talk about for the next month or so. I want to talk about apex predators. And I want to talk about the possibility that the apex predator of our world is the church. It is the most dangerous thing in the world. And nothing can hunt it that it can't beat. And so I thought this would be a good theme for this series. And we're going to be walking through the book of Acts uh, over the next little while. First of all, I want to picture what the church was like before uh, that started. Just right after Jesus had died and resurrected and there was this group of people, about 120. And they were praying in an upper room. When, and that day the church was founded, the day of Pentecost. And so I want to walk us through that over the next couple of months and, uh, and talk about it. But imagine their disadvantages. Okay, here's your mandate. You need to reach the whole world. You need to start a movement beyond borders, race, economics, age, and gender. So you want to start a movement that includes everybody. It has a message of hope built entirely on the invisible and afterlife. A lot of the things that this movement talks about or preaches about cannot be seen. And the greatest reward happens post-death. And so there's an enormous amount of faith that has to be built. It's from a sect within a sect within a sect. Christianity was about five layers below Judaism in many ways. In the, in the, um, the world of the Hebrews, there were the Sanhedrin, there were the Sadducees, there were the Pharisees, there were the teachers of the law, there were the synagogue rulers, there were all these people. And from within that little movement a group of people emerged that had this mandate. You, uh, part of this mandate of this church is combined with the care and education of any converts. So this wasn't a one and done thing. You didn't just win people. You actually had to take care of them afterwards. You had to teach them to contradict their own nature in many ways and envelop and embrace an idea that is both invisible and the benefits are after this life. The leadership has to be built from the ground up using secondhand information given by a leader that isn't alive anymore. So the founder of this movement isn't around anymore. Now he's alive, we believe he's risen and he's at the right hand of the Father, but he wasn't present anymore in this world. It's within a polytheistic world. It's, it's one religion among religions, that, that tons of religions that had all kinds of different gods and deities and, and all those kind of things. It quite literally existed within a world of hundreds of gods in different cultures. And they, as far as the intellectual goes, the, the Greek philosophy was at its apex at this time. This was a time when philosophers and, and, and wise people and rulers and all that bought into Greek philosophy and it was such a part of the culture. In fact, it was the biggest threat outside the Roman Empire to the Jewish culture. Is They came and they built um, theaters and they built all these things that echoed uh, Greek philosophy and contradicted a lot of the Jewish beliefs in God and things. It's a pacifist movement in a culture without human rights where the death penalty and violence is often the most common punishment. So it's a very violent world, but it's not a violent movement. It is not a movement where people take up arms against their oppressors. On the contrary, it is a movement that turns the other cheek, that um, works completely without the weapons of war. 
but that doesn't mean it doesn't have weapons. So uh, anytime uh, I, I learned this studying business, anytime you're about to endeavor and you're about to start out on something, you should do what's called a SWOT analysis. A SWOT analysis is a way of breaking down the real picture of what you're trying to do and looking at the possibility of things that are going to be weaknesses that you can either address or strengths that you can focus on. So here's a SWOT analysis of the church in its early days. Strengths. You have a very committed few. And a few people who are really committed can accomplish a lot. They have some life experience, which means it's going to be people reaching other people who probably have a lot in common. It's a solid example in teaching from its founder. Jesus is pretty easy to talk about because he's pretty awesome. In fact, today in the anti-Christian world is really interesting the number of people that still are attracted to Jesus. It's had two years of seed planting. So Jesus has worked with them day and night from morning till night with this group of people for two years. They've seen amazing things. What are some weaknesses? Well, they have no resources. They're all poor. Uh, they have small numbers. So it can't be everywhere at once. The government opposes them. In fact, the government killed their leader and would be quite willing to kill anybody that would talk about their leader in any way. It was in occupied territory, so the Romans were there. So they not only had the oppression of the um, religious leaders, they had the oppression of uh, the Roman Empire who would see any uprising or any, any signs of of thinking or freedom or anything like that would see as an opposition and a danger to that empire. What are the opportunities? Well, there's a large number of, of oppressed people. There's a lot of people that are looking for hope in the world, that Roman world. There's Roman peace, which means you can travel freely around the Roman Empire um, quite easily. And this is actually can't be uh, underappreciated enough. The ability to travel around the empire in different ways from country to country because of Roman peace was fairly unique. They had a common language. Everybody in that world used Greek as kind of a common language that everybody participated in. And they had an enthralling message, a message of hope. What threats? Well, there's fear. They would have a lot to be scared of. They had a bad reputation to contend with because they're off, the opposing forces often were willing to compromise their moral and ethical standards in order to degrade the church. So they would lie about them. Um, the Romans in the early church would talk about what they called love feasts. And what it was is the Christians would get together for communion, but they spread rumors that there was all kinds of kinky stuff going on. It was all this, and they were an immoral people. The Jews talked about how they, they believed in somebody that... that turned out was a you know a bad person and that the way to God that they talked about was not scriptural and things like that they just had they had a reputation to overcome they had a committed opposition an opposition that would not be happy until they were completely eradicated and they had the threat of violence they had the threat of violence so who would put money on that movement doesn't look like it can accomplish much does it you know it it in many ways, you look at it and you think it'd just be in like another religion that, you know, kind of found its way through and, you know, maybe had a few committed people and maybe influenced some people in some countries and, you know, all those kind of things. Nobody could see what was going to happen to where followers of Jesus Christ at the end of the second century numbered, or sorry, uh, yeah, second century numbered one in five people in the entire Roman Empire. So why? Why was the church so successful? And, and if it was successful, what is the basis for that success? And is that success accessible to us? Are, are we in any way similar to those people? Or do we have access to anything that that early church had access to? that could help us build a movement today. 
You know, I, I talk a lot. We're replanting Kawartha Community Church. Two years have ravaged the churches all over the place. A lot of them are financial trouble. They're laying off staff. Half their members have left, all those kind of things. The pandemic has really separated the sheep from the goats. It really has. It has shown for many of us who was navigating our walk with Jesus in a way that brought tangible results with them and then others who maybe were coming to church for a different reason and after two years off have fallen off the habit of it. And so the question for Korth Community Church is, are we done? And are we going to struggle along? Are we as a movement finished or we got something coming that God is planning you see, the one thing I love and this is what I love about church planting unless God intervenes you're toast the only thing when you started I remember when we started Korth Community Church everything existed in two boxes one box was for the kids ministry one box was for the services we had no sound system we had no uh, video projectors. All we did was we had a group of people that met in a college. We didn't even have worship when we started. I'll tell you, you go six weeks, start a church with no singing at all. When the singing starts, people really sing. You know, they kind of miss it. And we had all that stuff. We had established churches all over the city, churches with large staffs, amazing programs, beautiful buildings, attractive sanctuaries. Yet, Kawartha Community Church took off like a rocket. Why? What were the intangibles of it? Were we lucky? Was there something different about us from other churches? I mean, there were some tangible things that were different, but... What made Kawartha Community Church work? Well, I gotta tell you, when God spoke to my wife and I, we knew it was gonna happen. We knew we could not fail because God had spoken to us as he is speaking to us today. And so I wanna talk about some of Jesus. These are some of Jesus' last words to his followers. And I wanna talk about an intangible that we have to embrace if we're going to move forward. We have to embrace if we are going to see a miracle happen. And I want to walk through some of those things with you. Jesus, before he died, he had these, these close relationship talks with his disciples. This was with his inner core, the 12. And things he shared with them about what would happen when he left. Because he knew he was going to die and be resurrected. And he knew they would be on their own. He knew that he wouldn't be there to bail them out in person. And so he talked to them about what the difference would be, what was going to equip them to be the church going forward. And so here are some of his words. You can read through in John 14, 15, and 16, and 17. There's just beautiful stuff. I mean, there's more, there's more good theology and good church methodology in those chapters than just about anywhere in the Bible. But let me read through some of the things that Jesus said. Jesus said to his closest followers, If you love me, keep my commands. And I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you will know him, for he lives with you and will be with you. Going on in chapter 14. All I have spoken to you while still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you and peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. On verse uh, chapter 16 of John. But very truly I tell you, for it is good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove to the world that... Prove to the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because people do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, 
He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own. He will speak only of what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he, he, he will receive what he will make known to you. So Jesus talked about this advocate. Um, and uh, not to get too theological with you in that, but we believe in what we call the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the Godhead. We believe in one God, but he's made up of three um, beings that share essence, which means you don't know where one starts and the other ends, and everything that God does involves all three. You can go right back to creation. Um, and the world was void, and the Spirit hovered over the surface of the water, and God said, who's, who's God's voice? Jesus, the Logos, the Word. Let there be light. All three beings involved with that. And we see that all the way through the Old Testament. But the most unknown aspect to the deity, there's a lot of talk about Jesus, and there's a lot of talk about the Father in the Old Testament, but there's also these mentions of the Spirit of God. And normally Spirit of God would come on someone at a time where they were about to do something spectacular. It would come upon a general who was about to lead the troops into war. It would come upon a prophet who would share a word from God directly to the people. And uh, this was a rare occurrence. There's one time in Moses' ministry when he was leading the children of Israel out of Egypt and they were in the wilderness where a group of people in that setting um, were touched by the Holy Spirit and spoke um, these messages by the power of the Holy Spirit and, and someone goes to Moses and is really concerned, say, look, there's, you know, this, this is happening among these group of people. This is not a good thing. There's too many prophets. There's too many words. There's, you know, this, this needs to be an exception or whatever. And Moses says, no, no. What the world needs is if everybody could be filled with the Holy Spirit. I wish that would happen. And so there's this talk of this advocate now, it was really interesting because <clears throat> my roots are Pentecostal. And I grew up in a church um, where this type of ministry was always in the forefront. And I had many Christian friends who were very uncomfortable with it because um, they believed different things about Christianity, about things, but they were a little scared off by the Spirit because sometimes the way the Spirit was manifest in the Pentecostal church was socially very uncomfortable. And sometimes some people would use that kind of Pentecostalism to promote themselves as super spiritual or super weird. And sometimes they would combine. Sometimes you got somebody that was a kind of a combination of, of mysticism and bipolar condition. And they, they would express themselves in a way that would just freak people out. And so any talk of the Holy Spirit when I was growing up, even though I was in the Pentecostal church, any talk of the Holy Spirit made people, Christians, especially uncomfortable. And, and it was like there were sections of the Bible they wanted nothing to do with because they didn't want that discomfort. And so they would preach from the Gospels. They would preach from the Old Testament. They would preach from the Epistles, but they never or hardly ever spoke from the book of Acts because of this truth. The book of Acts is not about Peter. It's not about Paul. It's not about Philip. It's not about any of those characters as much as it's about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the leader of the church in the book of Acts. Jesus is the head of the church. The Holy Spirit are his words in action. And something happened with those group of people that the odds were totally against. And they came from this little backward state on the outer edges of the greatest empire the world had ever known and by the end of 200 years they were everywhere they were everywhere they were made up of all kinds of people all ages all nationalities all um, rich poor middle income all the slaves and free people soldiers and 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 non-soldiers thinkers and philosophies all of them were touched by this message so, what do we do with this idea? You know, are we going to look at it as a church and go, well, it's kind of weird for me. 
this role of the Holy Spirit in the church? Or are we going to be desperate enough? And I mean this in an entirely positive way. Are we desperate to see God work in our world? Do we want to see people come to Christ? Because Peter said the people are going to understand, are going to be touched when in relation to their need for the Savior by the Holy Spirit. He's going to show people that, that sin is a struggle and they need to overcome it. He's going to convict them of things that they've done wrong and, 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 and make them want to change. He's going to, he's going to cultivate in people this desire for more, this hunger. He's going to take the leaders of the church and the participants of the church and he's going to direct them about where they go and what they do. He's going to be the leading edge of the church. And he's going to be the difference maker between an ordinary person and an apex predator. When we look at Peter and we look at him in the Gospels, a lot of times Peter opens his mouth to change feet. It seems like he can't say or do anything right when he's under Jesus. But on the day of Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit descends on the church, Peter is completely transformed. And you can look at it and say, well, you know, he's got some seasoning, he's got some experience. Yeah, Jesus taught him. I mean, there's a lot of practical stuff inside of Peter. But there's an edge there. There's, a, there's some sort of exceptional thing about Peter on that day that makes him way more effective than he should be. You know, you got to remember, this is Israel at a time that Jesus has come and died and some people say he's alive and the authorities are worked up and nobody wants to talk about him and, and there's fear in the city and all these kind of things. And into that setting, you're going to have a guy named Peter who is one of the followers of this supposed dead leader get up and speak. What do you think he's going to do? Well, he could get his brains bashed out. He could get thrown in jail. He could get ridiculed. He could get pelted with stones. Instead, something amazing happens. And this is the tail end of his message. I challenge you this week to read Acts 2. That's your chapter of homework this week. But this is what Peter said at the tail end of his sermon. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? But Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Okay, so much in that, that statement. He's saying to them, salvation is accessible to you. It's not going to happen through the different aspects of Judaism. It's not going to happen through the law. It's not going to happen through some brilliant philosophy. It's going to happen in absolute trust to Jesus. And then there's more. Not only are you going to have this absolute trust, but you're going to have this power that is going to come from directly from God himself, who will take residence up in you and will enable you to do things that you could never dream. And here's Peter. What's he saying? He's saying this message for you and for your children and for those who are far off. Right at the beginning of the church, this guy is saying, this thing's going to go everywhere. How could he know that? Well, Two things. One, Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. He trusted Jesus. But also, because Peter was speaking what God had put in his heart that God was going to do. You know, there's something about having surety that you can accomplish something in the Lord. There's something of a surety to it. I remember I talked to, uh, it was David Morris, who was a pastor here in town at Elam. Um, he passed away a few years ago. Really nice guy. Very, very people-oriented and things. And, and David said that he was in the British Army. Uh, God had called him to Canada. He knew he was going to pa be a pastor in Canada. And he said he's in the British Army in India, and he's got bullets whizzing over his head and, you know, all kinds of, you know, dangerous situations and all those kinds of things. And D David said, I knew I could not die. 
because God had called me to Canada. He said, I had no fear. Imagine that surety. Right? Imagine that kind of confidence. When my wife and I planted the church, we had that kind of confidence. When we, when we started those first few services, and you want to know something funny, I think it was of the first five or six weeks, there were three weeks that Canada had major freezing rain. And like we'd show up there, and we're like, we barely got here. Is anybody going to show up? But wouldn't it be interesting that God had called the core of people that all had trucks at the beginning of our church, all these SUVs and everything, we'd come in, and they were all like, oh, freezing rain, no big deal. But it was like all week, it'd be sunny and clear, and no snow or whatever, and every Sunday there would be this huge storm, you know? But I knew we could not fail. I just had this assurance that God was going to do something, and that God was going to work through us. So I want to talk about two aspects of this. One, the intangibles of Peter's messages and the intangibles of the Holy Spirit and a little bit the Holy Spirit. I'm just going to crack the door open a little bit with the Holy Spirit because we're going to talk more and more about that as this series goes on. But let me talk about the intangibles of the Spirit. There's something in what Peter says and what Peter does which stands out. Now for years, theologians used to say that the early church was special that the Holy Spirit worked in them in a certain way and that he didn't anymore. That basically at the end of the first century there would be no more miracles, there would be no more great movements, there would be no more healings, there would be no more prophecy, all those things, because the Bible would be finished. And as soon as the book of Revelation was written and published, that we didn't need all that other stuff anymore. And it's interesting because that was totally wrong. It was a complete lie. It was just bad theology. In fact, the passage they picked to teach us stuff was, was found in 1 Corinthians 13, the chapter about love. And they used to take it and they look at it and they say, well, you know that verse where it says, you know, before we knew in part and we believed in part, but when we're known, we'll be known, known, you know. And they said, well, that's talking about the Bible. It's not talking about the Bible. It's talking about after you die, you're going to be able to see clearly. No, the Holy Spirit is still alive and active today. And, and, and here's the thing, is I've known many people. I remember, you know, just a couple of years ago, I was talking to someone um, in this church about our need for the role of the Holy Spirit in the church. And I remember uh, he said, oh, we're not going that way, are we? And I said, what way do you mean? He said, well, you know, like one of the things I like about KCC is, you know, we don't talk about a lot of spiritual stuff. <laughs> I'm thinking, boy, Scott, did you drop the ball? You know, because how do you think we do what we do? You know, what gets you up on Sunday mornings and helps you come to church? That's the Holy Spirit. What causes us to bring our gifts together and, you know, a few people with a few instruments sing and, and we feel the presence of God? That's the Holy Spirit. What motivates someone who's never been to church to come out to church or to ask a Christian what it means to be a Christ follower. It's the Holy Spirit. You see, the, the fallacy is we teach practical stuff, which is good. Practical stuff is good. In fact, one of the breath of fresh air as KCC was originally was it was practical. You know, so many churches have just gone, you know, so in such crazy directions where we talked about everyday life. We talked about family. We talked about how do you, you know, you get where you work, all those kind of things. And I will always be a practical teacher. And I want to tell you something that's really practical is the role of the Holy Spirit in the church. It is not a mystical help me Obi-Wan Kenobi the force kind of thing. It is instead an intangible aspect of every follower of Jesus Christ that basically gives them a boost where they will see, experience, and participate in things that would be impossible without him. You know, why, have, why, why do so few Christians lead other people to Christ anymore? Why, why do why does so many churches stagnate or plateau or decline? You know, what is it? What is it that brings that, that role where you get some churches that like take off and other churches struggle along? Craig O'Shell talks it, uh, in a book called It, one of the 
my favorite Christian ministry books, it talks about how often you can walk into a church and in the first 10 seconds know whether it has it or doesn't have it. There's just this buzz, this excitement, this anticipation of a church that is alive and thrilling. And, and you can do away with all kinds of tangible things that churches should have, right? Thriving kids ministry, youth ministry, you know, uh, big budget, you know, all these kind of things. You can do away with all of that, and if that church has it, people will sense it. People will come to experience it, and people will want to be a part of it. And the people that go out will have it with them when they leave. And that's the only way that comes about is by the role of the Holy Spirit. It's not weird, it's natural. It's as natural to a Christ follower as breathing. And, and, and woe to anyone who looks at the role of the Holy Spirit and says, we don't need that to be the church. Because the Holy Spirit is the apex predator of the church. When he's working with us, he takes a simple fisherman like Peter. And how many people came to Christ that first day? 3,000 and probably more. This guy stood up outside the temple, talked about the role of the Holy Spirit, talked about Jesus, and all of a sudden there's like thousands of people in the church. In fact, a lot of people think by the persecute, time the persecution broke out in the church in Jerusalem, it was numbering between 15 and 20,000. Why was the reason the Jewish leaders tried to eradicate the church at that time? Because the whole city was becoming the church. You take a city of 100,000 people, which is huge, and you take one in five of them and they become followers of Christ, people's attention gets worked up. So what is Peter talking about? Well, first of all, the benefit of brand new life. When the Holy Spirit is active in the life of a believer, it changes things here. It makes us um, understand scripture easy. It, it brings to mind things that maybe we forgot. It, there's all these coincidences that happen around us. You know, it would be really interesting because John and I, a lot of times when I'm writing a series, I'll come across a message that I just haven't got together. And I got to really work on it that week. And I try to send him, you know, my outline or I try to send him that kind of thing. But sometimes I can't. By the time it's so late in the week that, that you know, he's got to pick his songs. He's got to pick his songs for the series. And if, if I had a dime for every time John finds a perfect song that matches that sermon, I would be a billionaire. Why? Because the same spirit that's working in me to write that message is working in John to pick his music. And this happens all this time. There's so few Christians that are awake enough to see the work of the spirit, but those who are, they just see amazing things in their life. They look at the world differently. This brand new life we have in Jesus when we accept Christ as our Savior and His Holy Spirit fills us and empowers us, is unlike anything anyone in the world will experience. There's a confidence, a boldness, there is a surety, and there is this, what I call the prompting of the Holy Spirit, these little miracles that happen in our heart where God will say, talk to that person. Reach out to those people. You know, sit here this morning buy so and so a coffee you need to talk to that person about Christ this is the time you need to speak up you see because you can't teach that there is no tangible 12 step program where you can get somebody to accomplish the work of the church in the world you can't I mean, I've written vol or writ read volumes of things on church administration and accounting and all those kind of things, and they're all good things. They're part of the church. We need that structure. It's healthy. But the thing you need that you can't do without, because you can do without an awful lot in a church, are believers that have the Holy Spirit active in their, in their lives and in their hearts. It's an amazing thing. It's a benefit of a brand new life. It makes us better husbands and wives. It makes us better fathers and mothers. It makes us better people. There used to be, it's really interesting because there's been a lot, a lot written about this. Uh, uh, Max Weber, uh, sociologist, wrote about what he called the Protestant work ethic. And uh, 
there's this, this saying that used to be about, uh, people would say, okay, you know, Joe's an alcoholic, he beats his wife, he spends all his money on gambling and, and booze and all this kind of stuff. But then he meets Jesus. And he changes. And all of a sudden, you know, he starts bringing his paycheck home. He's buying healthy food for his kids. He doesn't beat his wife. They fall in love again and they work together. And his kids, he brings them out to church and, and, and he learns how to live differently. We used to call that redemption lift. It was kind of a sociological occurrence that happened. When people met Jesus, they changed so much that all these other good things started happening in their lives. And that happens so commonly that, that sociologists used to scratch your head and say, well, why is it? And the Protestant work ethic Max Weber used to talk about was, he said it was Calvinism. You know, is this belief you want to be one of the elect, so you work really hard to look like one of the elect. And, it, you know, some aspects of that were relevant, but the intangibles of it is not anything you can sociolo sociologically analyze. There is something different about someone that finds Jesus. When you take someone that's full of anger, fear, and hurt, and they meet Jesus and they, and they learn to forgive and their hearts become uncluttered and they love God and they worship him with openness. And they read their Bibles and they pay attention to it. And they do what it says and they pray. They can't stop praying. They walk around, they're praying. They're going to work, they pray. Something happens, they pray. They hear about someone, they pray for them. They are walking communication machines with God. Also, the promise of a better afterlife. You know? It's easy to give your life away if you know you've got a better one coming. And Jesus told his followers, you know, anyone who will lose his life will gain it. But he who tries to keep his life in this world will lose it here and lose it in the world to come. So many people that build this analogy and we're teaching it to our kids in school and we're teaching it in our college universities and there's a lot of dumb stuff making its way around the schools but the, the one that's probably the biggest lie is that you can find fulfillment completely in this life by making lots of money and having lots of nice things. And I would beg to differ. The meaning of life is that this life I've given is not my own. It's been entrusted to me. And as a steward of that, as a, as a caretaker of this life and body is given to me, Jesus invites me to give that life to him. And when I give that life to him, and I give this life away, and I turn over my dreams and hopes and all those kind of things, and I give them to Jesus... He makes you miserable and your life is horrible from that day forward. Do you believe me? <laughs> no, there's something that comes alive in us. There's something that is amazing when the things of this world have no hold over us. That are promised to a better life. When Peter's saying you will be saved, you're saved for this life and the life to come. An amazing life. And then everyone is welcome in this church. The Holy Spirit speaks to people. He doesn't care what nationality you are, or what gender, what age, how much money you got. He doesn't care about any of that. He works with human beings. Why? Because every human being has a divine spark, the image of God imprinted on us. And we were made to be living in a way that God exists in us and through us and he becomes our passion I have hobbies and I have many passions but my passion is Jesus my passion is knowing him and learning about him and my passion the things I feel drawn to in Christ are brought about by the Holy Spirit and what was the result in that early church the end of chapter 2 Verses 42 to 47, read them many times. Talking about the church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled in awe and many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. 
They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together and were glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Who wouldn't want to be part of that church? I tell you, it wouldn't drag yourself out of bed with a groan if that's where you were going in the morning. And so, I look at that, and I look at that, where we are as a church, and where we're going, and I go, God has us right where he wants us. A couple signs that our church is in the right direction is we are praying. We are praying. I've seen our church do more with prayer, and I love Doug and Tammy Schultz and what they've been doing with our prayer. I've seen our church pray more over the last couple of years than we have the decade previous. We are active in prayer. And it's not that we didn't have prayer. It's not that we didn't have intercession and all those kind of things. But, but we are seeing this partnership we have with the Holy Spirit, combining with our prayers, and we're seeing miracles. People are getting better. Lives are being changed. Jobs are being obtained. People are able to accomplish things. Miracle babies. You know, changes on a national level. These things are happening because the church right now is praying. And it's, it's uh, the, the intangibles of the church are being displayed in a way I haven't seen in a long time. And so, the question, is KCC going to get weird? No. KCC is going to get powerful. And you're going to see things, and I'm going to see things, and God is going to do things that are wondrous to behold. The question is, am I willing to embrace all God has for me in order to be a participant in what God will do in this city, in this country, and in this world in the coming months? I've talked to a lot of you about the um, return to the college. There are about like eight miracles wrapped in one in that. First of all, we didn't call them, they called us. You know, two years ago, we were renters of the college and sometimes inconvenient ones. Being moved about and discarded, we had, there was hostility there in some cases, support in others. You know, we went in there and we used their facility, but we had some good partnerships with the Student Administrative Council, with the Food Bank and things like that, that carried a good reputation. But over this last two years, what has happened with the last two weeks or whatever, is I've gone up to the college, I've paid my pay and display, I've put my parking thing in, I've walked into the college, and people are coming alive when they see me. Are you coming back? When are you coming back? We need you. We want to form a partnership with you. And it happens every time I'm up there. I'll meet a different person, uh, you know, who will say, oh, wait, we got something to show you. People are offering us things. They are asking us to come back. I phoned the president of the Student Administrative Council this past week. Because what we're going to do is KCC, we're going to meet there in exchange for participating and being the major donor of the food bank at Sir Sanford Fleming College. When food prices are going up and inflation is wiping people out, God is giving us a ministry, a tangible ministry, where we can make sure people can eat. <laughs> Imagine that. And everywhere I'm going, there's these doors swinging open. We left the college as renters. We're going back as partners. To where on every level there, they recognize that when you guys aren't there, the college isn't the college. How, how in today's day and age can you see that kind of willingness to invite an evangelical church on their site from a secular college? Did anybody see the miracle in that? We got, God is bringing us back there and he, I don't think he's bringing us back there to meet each week, sing a couple songs, drink some coffee, and contribute a couple cans to a food bank. Right there in the heart of 
a major institution of education with people coming from all over the world to come there. God is planting us right in the middle. Right there in what the old church would have called enemy territory. And God is placing us there. And God is telling us, you're the dangerous ones. You're not going there to survive. You're going there because there are students and teachers and people in our community and families and children who don't know Jesus. And they very much need him and very much want him, but they don't know where to get him. And we're going to exist within that setting as light and salt. And we're not, it's not going to work because we're nice people. It's not going to work because we're necessarily seeker sensitive. I'm, a, I'm into that stuff. I like putting things in everyday language. There's a lot of those intangibles which are absolutely meaningful. But the reason it will work is because God is going to work through you and me. And you're going to see these people, we've even seen a pandemic, just wander in from the street. Like, how do you even hear about us? People who will join us and be a part of it. And all God asks us to do is be participants. Because in this world, the apex predators of this world, the ones who are more dangerous, more powerful, more contagious, and more impactful than anybody else in the world is a follower of Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, praying, reading their scriptures, and open to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, who lives in liberty, who is not of this world, but of another world, who has, shares citizenship in heaven, who becomes part of a family, community of people from all different backgrounds, and all different people, and all different walks of life, and brings them together, and makes them into a cohesive, amazing team of people who share their passion and love for Jesus. And I know I've gone long today, but that's all I got to say about that. So just a couple of things. Uh, I'll take a couple of questions today, if you've got a question about today's topic. Um, today is an introductory message, so it's just a kind of a look into what we're going to do. But over the next few weeks, uh, starting on July 10th, we're going to start opening up this book and looking to see what God is doing. Anybody got a question today? Question or comment? It's not Thanksgiving. You don't have a turkey in the oven, so you can take a minute. Yes, Dougie. So, so this is uh, this. This might come across as I'm kind of picking a bone, but I'm not actually picking a bone. I'm just yeah, sure. Saying something that I think emphasizes a point that you were making. Yeah. That might go unnoticed. So, when you said that. In John 14, Jesus starts telling us about the Holy Spirit and what he's going to come. And yeah. He said he was speaking to the 12. Yeah. He wasn't actually speaking to the 12. He was speaking to the 11. It's true. Judas was already sent away. Yeah. I'm just saying this because actually you and I were just studying this together. That's right. Together. That's true. Yeah. But that's important because this is for believers. Right? Yes. Yeah. And the... He continues to emphasize, like up until then, Jesus, no, I don't think he ever talks about the Holy Spirit. He mm -hmm. talks about the Father and he talks yeah. about himself. Yes. Yeah. He doesn't talk much about it at all about the Holy Spirit, but now he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Mm. And actually it emphasizes that Judas isn't there. Yes. Because the other Judas asks a question and it says in the Bible, not Judas Iscariot. Yeah. I don't think the other Judas ever gets any press in the Bible anywhere else other than in this one place where he asks a question. Mm. And it's emphasized it's not Judas Iscariot. So, yes. And in this passage, Judas, Jesus makes it really clear. It starts with belief in me. Yes. But when you have that belief in me, this is the promise. Yes. And he makes it clear it's not for the world because the world won't accept it. Yes. But you will. Yes. So it's for you. Yeah. Yeah. So just emphasizing this idea that this is a gift to the church. It's a gift to the church. That's right. That's right. Excellent. Thank you. Good clarification, Dougie. Anybody else? Question or comment? All right. I'm going on holidays. And uh, I got good news for you because I was long-winded today. 
on the 10th and 17th, I videotaped my message, and they're only about 20 minutes long. So you're going to have good, short messages, concise. I love doing video messages because you can just cut and paste and do all this kind of stuff. But anyways, I digress. But anyways, it will continue our series on Apex um, as we do that. But I hope today I've whetted your appetite to the potential of thinking outside your present reality and going, what if? What if God worked through us? What if God had something that he wanted to do in our church and through our church? And, and what if our source of power and inspiration and direction came from God himself? Well, I tell you, that's dangerous. And as I tell believers over and over again, and I, I, I hope it sinks in by the end of my life, I hope this sinks into you. You're the dangerous ones. You're not the ones who are victims. There are no victims in the body of Christ. There are victors. And we are the dangerous ones. They can do things to our bodies and they can do things to us, but they can't rob us of the victory we have in Christ. And that's all I got to say about that. So God bless you. We'll see you in a few weeks. Thanks for being with us. If you have something to give, there's Square, debit and credit, and uh, offering. Thank you for your participation in that. And we look forward to seeing you again. God bless you as you go.